Hello. We are starting chapter 6 of A Lesson Before Dying, page 42. So we left off in chapter 5 with Grant finally being able to see Henry Pitchett, perhaps talking about um, letting him talk to Jeff. Alright, let's start. Chapter 6. Ines was in the kitchen when I came up to the back stairs, and she opened the door before I had a chance to knock. I could tell she had been crying. She had wiped the tears from her cheeks, but I could see the marks under her eyes. How are you, Ines? I'm making out, she said, not looking at me. You know why he sent for me? Mr. Sam's coming here at 5. You know why he sent for me? Mr. Sam's coming here at 5. I glanced at my watch. It was 10 minutes to 5. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Ines asked. No thanks. You want to sit down? She still did not look at me. I'm alright. I don't mind standing. I remembered how many I remembered how my aunt and Miss Emma had stood the night before. I don't know, Ines said, shaking her head. I just don't know. Now Mr. Lewis is in there trying to get a get a bet. A bet on what? She looked at me directly for the first time. She had large eyes, brown and kind. I could see traces of tears that she had tried wiping away. You can't get him ready you can't get him ready to die. Henry Pitcher didn't take that bet, did he? I left him in there talking. Mr Lewis said he got a whole case of whiskey he can't bet on. Henry Pitchett? He ain't betting against you. He ain't betting on you either neither. Smart man. Ines looked at me sadly. I didn't know if it was because of my cynicism or the task I had I had, I had facing me. She went back to the stove. With a dish towel, she lifted the lid of one of the pots, and I could smell a strong scent of onion, bell peppers, and garlic. She raised the lids on two other pots, but still the odor of the onions, pepper, and garlic pervaded the room. Ines left the kitchen. I heard the knock on the library door, and I could hear her and Henry Pitchett talking. Then she came back into the kitchen. How's Lou? As she asked me. She's all right, I said. I left her there with Miss Emma. I thought about them sitting at the kitchen table at Miss Emma's house. I had gone home after school to drop off my satchel, and when I did not find my aunt at home, I figured she was keeping Miss Emma company. I found them at the kitchen table, shelling pecans into two big aluminum can pans. I could see that neither my aunt or nor Miss Emma had any intention of going up to Henry Pitch's house with me. But if you need me to hold your hand, I'd be glad to go, my aunt said. I don't want him doing nothing he won't he don't he don't want to do, Miss Emma repeated the old refrain I had heard about hundred times the day before. I didn't answer them. I was angry already, and I knew things would just have gotten worse if I said anything else. I went back outside and got into my car and drove up to Pitchett's. Now, I looked at my watch again. It was 5.15. No Sam Guidry and no one else except Ines had come into the kitchen to say anything to me. Each time she returned from the library, Ines seemed more agitated. I knew she was feeling sorry for me. At 5.30, at 5.30, we heard people entering the house off the front gallery. Ines left the kitchen to meet them. She spoke to Edna Gidry, then to Sam Gidry, and to one or two other people. I could hear them talking as they came into the house. Ines turned to the kitchen with two empty glasses to be refreshed. She added four glasses to her tray. She took that to the library and came back. I'm sure it won't be too long, she said. She knew how I felt felt and she was crying trying to encourage me it was a quarter to six at six o'clock Egna Gurdry came back into the kitchen a tall woman in her early fifties she had light brown hair a narrow face and gray eyes she wore a shapeless black dress gray stockings and low heeled black shoes well Grant well Grant Grant how are you she said smiling and coming up to me with her hand out she stopped a good distance back and I had to lean forward to shake her hand which was long and bony and, and cold from her glass. Why, Grant, she said. I just do declare I haven't seen you in God knows how long. Been two, three years, I'm sure. Wouldn't you say? About that long, Miss Edna, I said. God, yes, she said. Why, well, you're looking just as fine like you're living the good life, doesn't he, Ignes? He's looking just fine, Miss Edna, Ignes said from the stove. Well, tell me all about yourself, Edna Gurdjie said to me. How you been? No, no, need to tell me. I can see you're doing just fine. Well, how is Lou? Why doesn't she come to see me? It's been how long? 
Oh. <coughs> 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 oh, I bet you it's been six, no, eight months living so close. You tell Lou, I say, make your bring. You tell Lou, I say, make you bring her to my house so we can sit down and talk. Lord have mercy, do. She turned from me to Ines. Mr. Henry says you may serve any time now, Ines. Yes, ma'am, Ines said. Edna turned back to me. Grant, please tell Emma how sorry I am about Jefferson. I would do it myself, but I'm just too broken up for this matter. I ran into Madame Grope just the other day. Lord, how sad she looks, just dragging along. Poor old thing. I had to put my arms around her. Edna drank from her glass. Tell Emma I'm sorry. I'm sorry to for both families. I hear you would like the privilege of visiting Jefferson. I hear you would like the privilege of visiting Jefferson. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll leave all that up to you and the sheriff, she said. He'll thank you after supper. She turned to Ines. Ines, is there anything that I may help you with? No, I got everything under control, Ines told her. Well, in that case, I may as well help myself to another quick shot. She poured about two ounces of Borden into her glass and added ice cubes. After drinking half of it, she went back to the library. Inez dished up the food. She had cooked a pot roast with potatoes and carrots, onions, bell pepper, and garlic. She also had rice and mustard greens, green peas, and cornbread. She took the pl platters and bowls to the dining room. Can I fix you something? She asked me when she came back to the kitchen. No, thank you, I told her. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten anything but a sandwich since breakfast but I would not eat at Henry Pitch's kitchen table. I had come through that back door against my will, back door against my will, and it seemed that he and the sheriff were doing everything they could to humiliate me even more by making me wait on them. Well, I had to put up with that because of those in the quarter, but I damn sure would not add her to injury by eating at this kitchen table. Ines went to the dining room and came back. They talking up there now about him, she said. Sheriff saying he don't like the idea at all. Saying nobody can make that thing a man. Saying might, saying might as well let him go like, go like he is. I hope that's, I hope that's his final word. I said, I sure would be, relieve my mind. Why don't you sit down? Ines said, you'll feel better. I'd rather stand. You sure I can fix you a little something to eat? No, thank you, Ines. She went back and came back. It won't be too long now, she said. They nearly threw. Soon as I served the coffee, you sure I can get you a cup of coffee? No thanks. I appreciate it though. She poured coffee into half a dozen small white cups and took the coffee, sugar, and cream to the dining room on a silver tray. She came back. He asked me if you if you, if you were still there, she said. I think he's gone let you see him, but he say he was still against it. I'm sure it's Miss Enna's making him do it. Well, all the time is Emma done spent with his family. That ain't asking too much. At a quarter to seven, Ines cleared off the table in the dining room and brought the dishes into the kitchen. Then she took a bottle of brandy back with her. A half hour later, while she was putting away the dishes, she had just finished washing Sam Gridry, Henry Pitchett, Louis Rue Woodrun, and another fat man came into the kitchen. I had been standing there nearly two and a half hours. Sam Gridry was a tall man, well over his six well over six feet and he was well tanned. His hair was dark brown, his sideburns and mustache showed some gray. His face was narrow, well lined and strong. His hands were large and hairy. He wore a brown suit and a tie. He usually wore a Stenson hat and cowboy boots. He had probably left the hat in the library or the dining room, but he had the boots on. The four white men split into pairs. Sam Gridry and Henry Pitchett stood on one side of the table, while Louis Ruin and the fat man stood over by the dish cabinet. They had brought their drinks with them. Inez left the kitchen as soon as the white man came in. I tried to decide just how I should respond to them whether I should act like the teacher that I was or like the nigger that I was supposed to be. I decided to wait and see how the conversation went. To show too much intelligence would have been an insult to them. To show lack of intelligence would have been a greater insult to me. I decided to wait and see how the conversation would go. Been waiting long, Sam Gridry asked me. About two and a half hours, sir, I said. I was supposed to say, not long, and I was supposed to grind, but I didn't do either. The fat man glanced knowingly at Louis Grun, Rugon, but Louis Rugon was looking directly at me. I could see in their faces that they had talked all this over and Sam Gridry had already made up his mind what he was going to do. What can I do for you? he asked. Louis Rugon and the fat man waited for my answer. I knew it didn't matter what I said. 
since Gudry had made up his mind. Henry Pitchett, standing next to Gudry, looked more tired than he than he than he had the day before. He seemed more sympathetic. Maybe he had been thinking about all the services Miss Emma had provided for his family over the years. It's about Jefferson's sheriff, Gudry, I said. I knew they have, so Gudry is a sheriff. What's his name? Sam Goodry. Sam Goodry is the sheriff. Goodry is the sheriff. It's about Jefferson Sheriff Goodry. I said I knew they had discussed it. Still, I had I had to go through the motions. His nana would like for me to visit him. What for? Goodry asked. They had discussed this too. I could tell from the way that the fat man drank from his glass. I could see in his face that he was amused. So was Louis Hugon. I knew they were both getting betting against me. She, she's old, I said. She doesn't feel that she had strength to come up there all the time. She doesn't, huh? Sam Gridry asked me. He emphasized doesn't. I was supposed to have said don't. I was being too smart. She doesn't, huh? She's old, I said. She doesn't feel that she has... She doesn't feel that she has the strength to come up there all the time. She doesn't, huh? Sam Gridry asked me. He emphasized doesn't. I was supposed to say don't. I was being too smart. Oh, okay, so he says that doesn't, but it should be don't because that's how they talk. She don't feel that she, because they're niggers and niggers don't know anything, but he was smart, so he emphasized doesn't. Okay, continue. Yes, sir, I said. She doesn't feel that she can. I used the word doesn't again, but I did it intentionally this time. If he had said if he had said I was being too smart and he didn't want me to come to that jail, my mind would definitely have been relieved. What about the preacher in the quarter? Can he visit him? I asked her the same thing. You did, huh? Yes, sir. And what did she say? She said there will be time for the preacher. She did, huh? Yes, sir. So she feels that he has that much time, time so she feels that he has that much time. Time for the teacher and the preacher? The fat man grunted. Louis Rudin's eyes showed that he was amused. Henry Pitchett next to Sam Gridry looked uncomfortable. What you plan on doing when you come up there? If I let you come up there, Gridry asked me. I have no idea, sir, I told him. You're not trying to play with me now, are you? Gridry asked. No, sir, I'm not, but I have no idea what I'll talk to him about. I hear from people around here you want to make him a man. A man for what? At this time? She asked me to go to him, sir. Her idea, not mine. That was not the question, Gudry said. Make him a man for what? To die with some dignity, I suppose. I suppose that's what she wants. You, do you think that's a good idea? That's what she wants, sir. What do you think? I would rather not have anything to do with it, sir, but that's what she wants. So you think he ought to go just like he is? I don't know how he is, sir. Believe me, Mr. Gridry, if it was left up to me, I wouldn't have anything to do with it at all, I said. You and I are in accord there, he said, but my wife thinks different. Now, which one do you think is right, me or her? The fat man snorted. He thought Gridry had me. I make it a habit never to get into family business, Mr. Gridry. The fat man didn't like that quick maneuver. I could see it in his face. You're smart, Gridry said. Maybe just a little too smart for your own good. I was quiet. I knew I knew when to be quiet. I don't like it, Gridry said. And I want you to know I don't like it, because I think the only thing you can do is just ag aggravate him, trying to put something in his head against his will. And I'd rather see a con contented hog go to that chair than an aggravated hog. It would be better for everybody concerned. It would be, it would be better for everyone concerned. There ain't a thing you can put in that skull that ain't there already. I remain quiet. You can come up there, Sam Gridry said. But the first sign of aggravation, I'm calling it off. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Do you have any questions? He asked me. Yes, sir. When can I see him? You can come any time you like. Not before 10 in the morning. Not after 4 in the evening. Any other questions? Sorry. Any other questions? Any idea how much time he has left? That's entirely up to the governor, not me, Kedri said. But I wouldn't plan on a diploma, okay? The fat man and Louis Rugan seemed impressed by the sheriff's questions and answers to me. 
Louis Rougon, who had light blue eyes, stared at me to make me look back at him, but I refused to pay him that courtesy. The fat man drinking rattled the ice cubes in his glass. Henry Pitchett appeared to wish all this was over with. Anything else? Gridry asked me. When can I start coming up there? Not for a couple of weeks, Gridry said. Let him get used to it. Report to Chief Deputy Clark if I'm not around. Don't bring anything up there you don't want taken away from you. Knife, razor blade, anything made of glass. Not that I expect them to do anything, but you can never be sure. Anything else? No, sir. Nothing else. Gidry nodded. Good luck, but I think it's all just a waste of time. Thank you, sir. I waited until they left the kitchen, then I went out to my car and drove away. So, end of chapter 6. So, the four men uh, come to Grant at the kitchen. They made him wait two hours. That's ridiculous. That's, oh, these white people. What is wrong with people? Made him wait two hours in the kitchen standing while they ate and drank and talked. That is, oh my gosh. For them to finish. So Grant, he denied the food, denied food, coffee, even a chair. Because he had nothing to do with them or from them. That's pretty smart. Grant is smart. He's hecka smart. So, uh, Grant, so Sheriff Goodry, Sam Goodry, agrees to let him see Jeff. Jeff doesn't want to do this. Does not want to do this. But he is doing it, doing it for uh, Miss Emma. Miss Emma. Miss Emma. Emma has worked for. Who has Emma worked for? Emma worked for. Emma has worked for a family of theirs, one of these people, and he's begging him that okay, I don't know who Miss Emma worked for, but the family that Emma worked for knows Sheriff Sam, and it is Emma's request that he that she is allowed Grant to talk to Jeff. Because Jeff is the grandson of Miss Emma? I don't know. How are they connected? Connection between Emma and Jeff. I don't know. Well, this is end to chapter 6. We will continue chapter 7 on page 51. Goodbye.